Dear all, I uh, hope you're doing well. Uh, welcome to the PhD PDF Scholarship Podcast, where we explore the world of research and academia. Today, we are privileged to have Professor Jeffrey Brooks, a well-renowned global researcher and Professor of Engineering at Swinburne University of Technology in Australia. Professor Brooks is a true luminary in the field of ferrous and non-ferrous metallurgy research with a distinguished career spanning decades. He has been honored with a lot of prestigious awards throughout his remarkable journey, including the recent and highly esteemed Bessemer Gould Award, the most prestigious recognition a scientist can receive in the field of iron and steel making. Join us as we uncover the pathways to nurturing innovative research ideas and gain a deeper understanding of research process as an early career researcher, guided by the exceptional expertise of Professor Jeffrey Brooks. Jeff, we would like to hear a few words from you before we delve into the discussion. You made me sound cleverer than I really am. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Noel. Uh, now, um, uh, just a little comment about that. Um, research excellence is a team sport. And the reason why I've had quite a lot of success, and I'm very proud of that success, you know, I'm very pleased about it, but it's because I've had fantastic students and I've had really great collaborators. And, uh, you yeah, know, yeah, it's a team sport. So when you see somebody win big awards, it's it's normally about a team of people. That's the honest truth. And I feel that that's very true in my, my own case. So thank you for the nice words. But I really do say research is a team sport. Okay, that's another way of putting in the Jeff manner. Yeah, so I think now uh, let's get start with the discussion. Uh, Dinesh can go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, to begin with uh, the topic, um, can you share some insights on how you have developed uh, your own research ideas throughout your career as a, as a global researcher? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I would like to tell you I had a deep strategy when I finished my PhD. I, I probably didn't have a deep strategy, but I, I had a few things that were, well, that I think, in, in retrospect, were good. Uh, one of the very first things was, I had some long-term strategic goals in my research, right? Mm. So for example, probably about one or two years after I finished my PhD, um, which is quite some time ago, that was 1993, so it was quite some time ago, um, I came up with the notion that I should try to become really outstanding in the area of the kinetics of steelmaking. So I sort of formulated my mind that this is something I wanted to be really good at. And I, I did that because I could I was very interested in it. And secondly, I just couldn't see that there was a proper understanding of it. Right. So I, I formed this kind of strategic idea in my head that this would be something that I would pursue, which I have, right? Mm. And it's the thing that's probably given me the most success in my career. So I had some long strategic idea in my mind, right? So I think it's good to have some sort of strategic goal in your mind, all right? So about mm. an area. It could be, you know, I really want to get on top of the you know the thermodynamics of uh, mm. of uh, uh, of uh, non of non ferrous smelting, or you, know, you can have some general goal like that. Um, then I would say there are opportunities that come up, right? So there's strategic yeah. goals, and then there are opportunistic things. Mm -hmm. So you know, along my career, various interesting ideas have come forward, and some of them I have chosen not to pursue, and other ones I have pursued. So, for example, about six, seven, eight years ago, I started to get interested in uh, the whole issue of how would we process minerals on the moon? Because I could see that the potential of of exploration and mining on the moon was really, really becoming a reality. And I saw some opportunities and I sort of went towards it, you know. And uh, so sometimes in your career, you have to um, look for opportunities, right? Like just be opportunistic. And you've got to try and make sense of these opportunities, but yeah, it's part of your research. So when you're early in your career, part of what you're doing is strategic, you know, like a long-term yeah. thing that you're thinking about. Another part of it is trying to look at what good opportunities come up in front of you, right? Yeah. Um, the third one is to be inspired by others. I wanted to raise that point. So one of the very important things I say to my students is, it's really important to hang around clever people. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to be clever, no. hang around clever people. Um, so, and so um, I was really lucky when I finished my PhD, I really worked with a totally brilliant person called Professor Howard Warner. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was quite a brilliant person. And, you know, he, was a, he inspired me and he was very influential in my thinking. 
and it was a privilege to work with him right so um but you don't have to be a professor like for example at the moment i'm doing some work in uh, some dark matter research and i'm working with a brilliant postdoc and that's actually the major reason why i'm working in this area because i'm inspired by his ideas actually so even though i'm the professor and he's the postdoc it's actually his ideas that i'm inspired by so i think trying to look for inspiration mm. is another thing so three things i i want to identify one some sort of should form some strategic idea um look at opportunities and see what they are and they might be interesting mm. and the third one is hey try and meet some clever inspiring people and All see right. that the, they may you know give you some ideas and some thoughts so this this is, this is this is what i should tell you i didn't i couldn't have said this when i finished my phd it's only in retrospect I can see that that was these things were going on. And of course, I made yeah. mistakes. Of course, I made bad choices sometimes in some of the things I pursued. But those are the three things I would identify that you should be thinking about. Okay, well, great. Um, so I have a follow-up question on that. Um, basically, it's like oh. in, uh, in the beginning, right? When uh, we are establishing the career, uh, it's often yeah. easy to think about, you know, how breadth we need to go versus how how depth we need to go in a particular topic, you know, yes. from, our, from here looking at particularly the opportunity things, right? Um, how do we, what are the pros and cons on, you know, uh, approach yeah. in one direction versus going in deep, let's say, uh, then and what yeah. we need to really watch out for when we are synthesizing different ideas? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. It's a complicated question as well. I don't think there's a very straightforward answer. Um, but certainly depth is an important thing in scientific mm -hmm. knowledge. So there's certain things that you should decide that you're going to be really clever at. Right. So, you know, you know, for me, it's been kinetics, right? Kinetics of, you know, reactions. Now, you know, so whenever I see, you know, that basically once you make a decision that you're going to do that, that means that when you see, you know, the latest paper on that topic, you read it very carefully, right? And see whether you can yeah. learn something and you discuss it with people and you go out of your way to try and understand it, right? Mm. Um, so, you know, there's a couple of things that you want to be really clever at. And then there's other things that you're interested in, but you're not trying to be really deep in. So, for example, a good example would like to be like that would, for me, be scanning electron microscopy. Hmm. I like scanning electron microscopy. I appreciate it. But, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to be an expert in it. I, I, I like to meet experts, you know, like right. I appreciate it, you know. So um, I think there's some things you choose to be deep in and other things that you choose to say, all right, well, I know, I know about it, I know enough. For example, I know enough about scanning electron microscopy to talk sensibly about it. You know, I understand it basically, but, you know, I mean, um, I don't know the in-depth depth details. So, so I think that's sort of choices you have to make. If you yeah. try to be deep at everything, that's kind of ridiculous. You can't do that <laughs> yeah. unless you're sort of a bit freakish. Um, and then if you just sort of shallow and everything, it's, I think that's very unsatisfactory. I think you end up, you end up not having deep insights into the field. You end up sort of skating on the on the on the edges all the time. So I think it's right. important to have a few in depth, but you can't have too many. It's just we're not we're not capable of having yeah. you know, too many really in depth things. True. So I think it's a few things that you really want to be clever at, and a few other things. Yeah, you want to understand it, but you're not trying to become a, a great expert. I hope okay. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for your clear insights. No so, moving on to the next point, like uh, when you when you think from an early career researcher, say uh, they often find difficulty uh, in trying to bring some novelty into their research proposal and the feasibility uh, of that proposal. So. Uh, mm. When you look at from a professor perspective it, uh, as a new proposal, like how do you view this, and what is your recommendation that you can give it to the uh, early career researchers in drafting uh, their right. research proposal or navigating this challenge effectively? Well, I think be bold, but don't be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think it's good to have you know like bold ideas, um, and I think it's good to put those ideas forward. Now, sometimes they're not feasible, right? For example, um, I think when I was younger, I had this idea that I wanted to revolutionize steelmaking in, and make it continuous. And I really believed it. And I kind of pushed it. It probably wasn't a very realistic idea, not because it's a bad idea. It wasn't like a stupid idea or anything. It's just that, well, you know, <laughs> steel plants cost a lot of money. <laughs> so, you know, trying to convince somebody to invest in that is rather difficult. Um, so in that situation, 
I don't think you should abandon your idea. I think what you should do is look at other ways of pursuing it. So you can model, you can do models, you can construct models. For example, that's not so expensive. Uh, or you can do very elegant experiments or, or experiments that are very um, well designed. Um, so I think when you have an idea that's bold and perhaps a little bit beyond the, the, the funding available to you or anything, you shouldn't abandon it. You should think of some clever ways of, you know, developing it. Um, so in my case, yeah, I, I'm happy to say, you know, my ideas are coming on continuous still making are coming back a bit in vogue. I, when I first started, I used to push these ideas and everybody used to go, never happened. And now people are going, you know something, that Brooks guy, what he was saying in 1995, he's probably right. <laughs> Who knows? So, you know, but you, but you have to find a way of pursuing it. And modeling is a, a good way of, of where you, you're, you're basically minimizing the amount of money involved. Right? Um, and, and also, as I said, elegant experiments. Um, one thing I want to say to you that's a very, I want to give advice to anybody listening here. If you get a chance to go to McGill University, and in McGill University, they have a physics laboratory. Sorry, a, a museum, sorry. It's in the physics department. And it's a museum um, which is basically in honour of Ernest Rutherford. And for those who aren't familiar, he's probably the, you could argue, maybe the greatest experimental physicist of all time. I mean, he'd be neither one or number two, depending on your point of view, right? So complete genius. And um, the equipment that he used while he was at McGill has been maintained in this wonderful museum. And when you go into this museum, you will notice the following. First of all, you'll see really, really simple e equipment, <laughs> like, like really basic, like just, you know, but very brilliantly designed and very brilliantly conceived. And you'll see labels under the equipment like, with this equipment, Einstein, uh, Rutherford and his student established the mass of the electron. Oh. Oh. That's brilliant. Okay. With this equipment, with this equipment, they established the charge ratio of protons and neutrons or whatever, you know, whatever. Um, whatever, the, whatever the measurement is. And he did brilliant, brilliant work with what to us looks like very, very basic equipment. And what I noticed is when I looked around this laboratory is the flair, the innovation, the, you know, the improvisation, quite, quite amazing. So I think that's something to keep in mind, um, especially in experimental science. Sometimes it's the it's the elegant, the clever, the you know, it's the insightful experiment, not the expensive experiment. Um, of course, I'm not saying you don't, it's not good to have good good money, but of course it is. But sometimes you don't, and if you can improvise around that, you can you know do some good things. So that's one observation I would make. So uh, before I ask the next question, uh, so this uh, McGill University is it in uh, is it in Ontario? I mean, uh, no, no, it's in uh, it's oh, you said a terrible thing there. It's in Quebec. Oh, it's in Quebec. Oh, wow. Uh, you, you, uh, you should you should explain that people in Quebec would be very upset if you said <laughs> they're if they're in Ontario. I, I think it's in it's in Mon Montreal, I believe. Yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah, Montreal. It's in Montreal. Yeah. Uh, oh. There's a great, there's a great sort of rivalry between Ontario and Quebec. It's, it's sort of Absolutely, a state you yeah. want to make them. Upper so, Canada and Lower Canada. This, yeah, this it's, year, it's, yeah. It's, it's, in, it's in Quebec, yeah. Yeah, well, that's amazing. Uh, interesting to know that it's in Canada. I mean, uh, yeah. Oh, Rutherford was at, um, he was at Cambridge. And if you go to Cambridge, they, I think they have the museum in his honour. And if you go to, he was at Manchester for a while as well. And I'm pretty sure they have something there as well. Because when you're that clever and that amazing, everybody wants to remember that you were there. Mm -hmm. So we could all aspire to be as clever as Ernest Rutherford, right? Uh, he had yeah. many, many brilliant students, like, you know. Um, yeah. And actually, if you ever want to understand truly great research leadership and research um, development of a great research group, Rutherford. Okay. Read about Rutherford, because Rutherford had a great culture. He was a genius, but he, he also created people who were genius. You know, he was a great, he had a great talent for bringing geniuses together and, and really getting people to do great work. Um, so in the history of physics, you know, people talk about the Rutherford model, about how to run a research group. Um, so he's quite an inspirational guy. Any engineer should benefit also by reading about Rutherford. So quite extraordinary, extraordinary person. So um, I have so to yeah. say he's a, New, he's a New Zealander as well. So not an okay. Australian, but a New Zealander. Yes. 
So you saw, uh, I, I saw a picture in Facebook recently uh, of uh, three scientists uh, being students of each other. So basically, J.J. Thompson was, uh, uh, you know, who proposed, who discovered the electron and plum pudding model. Yeah. Uh, he was the, he, uh, he was a professor of uh, Ernst Rutherford. Yes. And then, uh, and then Rutherford, uh, he taught, uh, you know, I, I think Chadwick, uh, yes. who discovered uh, yeah, the you yeah, but from, from Rutherford, you could draw about six branches. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure he had three or four of his students had Nobel Prizes. I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. Yeah. So he'd have many branches, but they're three brilliant people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I mean the way he discovered the, uh, uh, the discovery of uh, nucleus, nucleus of an atom, mm -hmm. you know, he, he described, described it as, you know, uh, as if a bullet had been, you know, yeah uh, yeah it's a brilliant it's a brilliant elegant experiment yeah yeah, yeah. famous one the gold foil experiment gold yeah, foil, very, yeah. Famous, Absolutely. very yeah. very famous experiment but he did several <laughs> quite, a few, quite a few brilliant experiments yeah. Yeah. yeah um so i would like to ask the next question so which is like um uh, early career researchers often face uh re limited res resources and yeah. funding Yes. Uh, especially uh, here in Canada and North America, uh, it's yes. woefully underfunded. Uh, we, we, we do require more funds, uh, uh, you know, the research to be more funded over here. Yeah. Um, how can they optimize their research ideas? How these earlier career researchers yeah. can optimize well, their research ideas? I have a few, a few, a few, few concepts about that. Uh, the first one, as I mentioned, is imagination. And I'm going to give you another story about imagination in a minute. Um, the second one, the stories are the best way of telling these things, right? The second yeah. one is, of course, innovation, right? Just being innovative, finding a cheap way of doing something, as we've already mentioned. And the third one is collaboration. So if you have a really brilliant idea and you don't have the resources for it, but say there's a really brilliant professor, a well-established professor down the, down the corridor, normally smart people like meeting smart people. So if you went and knocked on the door of this professor and said, I've got this idea, you know, I can't get any funding, yet. you got any ideas, you know, you might find he or she will be quite excited about your idea or, or, or see some version of it that they like very much. Or maybe it's another university. Maybe there's a very smart person down the road who's got a you know, similarly inspired. So, so collaboration is another way, like another way of, you know, um, uh, you know uh, seeking out uh, some funding. And... Um, and so uh, I did that quite a bit when I was, uh, I still do it quite a bit actually, um, where, you know, if I'm short of resources myself, I go and talk to somebody who's doing something and we team up together. Uh, that's quite a good way of doing things and um, a good way also to make uh, enduring partnerships. Um, the bit about I was going to mention, the story I was going to tell you about imagination comes from my predecessor. Uh, my first academic job was as a lecturer of steelmaking at University of Wollongong. So just to explain, Wollongong is a steel city, right? So the lecturer of steelmaking at Wollongong is actually sort of a fairly <laughs> prominent position because the, the city is built on steelmaking, right? And my predecessor was a man called Professor Standish. And uh, he's, a, he's a very interesting man, very funny man. And I arrived in my job at Swinburne, uh, sorry, at, sorry, Wollongong, excuse me. And I'd never met him before. And, and he came to my office and he introduced himself and we had a chat. And he told me a couple of stories, and this story I remember. He said, when I arrived at Wollongong, I, I didn't have, I was just studying my research. I, I was really interested in blast furnaces, right? And um, I wanted to do research in blast furnaces. So I, um, I went to the head of the department and I said, look, I want to do experiments on the blast furnace. I need some equipment. Can you help me? And he said, I'm sorry, we just, we just don't have any money. We just, we don't have any money at all. Nothing. So he said, he drove down to the hardware shop and he walked in and he saw a piece of clear plastic pipe about this diameter, about this long. And it was like $10 or something. So he bought it. He had this piece of pipe. He said, that is a blast furnace. This is the blast furnace, right? Now, the ore, how big would the ore be if this is the blast furnace. And then he went, well, it'd probably be about the size of bird seed. So he went to the um he went to the uh to the pet shop and he bought a bag of bird seed. And this was only like 50 cents or a dollar or some very small amount of money. So he had the bird seed. 
Then he went back and he set it up and he had a he put a he bottom on the bottom, he put a hole in the bottom and he stacked it full of seed and let the seed come out. So he said, oh, there's the iron ore coming into the blast furnace and then it's flowing through the blast furnace, right? And then he said, well, how am I going to track the movement? So then he got a, 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 a red texter and he got the bird seed and he sat there and he coloured all the bird seed with red texter. And then he put it at the top of the cylinder and then he watched when the red seed would come out the bottom. And then he went, right, well, now it's a, it's a reactor. So I can use resonance time distribution theory to understand the flow patterns inside the blast furnace <laughs> from this model. And that was the start of his research. Now, as he said, it wasn't a particularly good experiment, but you know, it was a start. It was a, uh, a reasonable starting point. All right. And actually he became very well known in blast furnace research starting at that point. All right. So I think a little bit of imagination is, is, is a good thing, right? Um, and you, you know, you can't understand a blast furnace using a plastic pipe and a bit of uh, bird seed, but you, you're, you're, you're on the way to understanding something. Yeah, you're, you're heading in the right direction, right? So I think uh, a bit of imagination is an important thing. I think also the collaboration aspect is um, very important. Teaming up with other like-minded people and trying to help each other. And um, so I think that's another way you can address that issue. So basically, in summary, use your imagination, uh, look for innovative ideas to keep the cost down, and uh, you know, uh, collaborate. Um, you know, that's the best way. Don't lose, don't lose faith. Um, try to find some way around your problems. If you have, if all your research ideas involve millions of dollars outlay, <laughs> you need to um, refine your way of thinking. Uh, because something I can just say is something that's that's something that's really wonderful about um, uh, mathematics, mathematical things, right? Because you know you can do clever things with maths without really spending much money. So when I first got, so I mentioned to you before, I was interested in continuous steel making. Well, I couldn't afford to build a continuous steel pilot plant, right? Obviously, <laughs> right? But I could do some mathematical analysis of the of the mass transfer. And I did, and I did a lot of mathematics, you know, and pen and pencil and, you know, and then a little bit of computer numer you know, analysis, uh, used starting from very simple relationships and then making them more complex. And I learned a great deal from doing that. And uh, I advanced my knowledge. So that's another way, of course, the mathematical approach or the computing approach, which is relatively cheap. Uh, in terms of resources, I hope that uh, I hope my, I hope that's helped you with the question. Yeah, that was quite insightful in terms of um, understanding, and it was a motivation that even if we don't have funding, like we can start something like a scrap yard, like a backyard uh, experimental lab, and try yeah. to see whether if it is matching with some of the scientific concepts, and then we can present. Yeah, yeah I have a lab at the back of my home. <laughs> it's working perfectly well. You well know, we can fund. <laughs> Can I give you a simple example of something I did myself? A few yeah. years ago, I wanted to get research, quite a few years ago actually, I wanted to get research and understanding the heat transfer of scrap melting. And one of the things I was trying to understand is how would preheat, if you preheated the scrap, how would that affect the speed of melting? All right? Have a guess. This is the way I studied it. <laughs> I've got, I got my fridge and I put a whole lot of ice blocks and the setting on the, the freezer was minus 20 and you could move it up to minus 10. So what I did was I got the ice blocks at minus 24 and I put them in a cup and I then timed how long it took to melt down to a certain level. In fact, I, I measured the volume of the water collecting at the bottom and then I you know, graphed it. And then I put the freezer at minus five or whatever it was and then put the ice, same ice blocks into the cup, exactly the same experiment, and then did the timing of that experiment to see how the heating of the ice would affect the melting rate. And while I was doing these experiments, I also learned, I noticed a lot of things about melting. For example, if you put the ice blocks in such a way that the water is draining away as they melt, it takes a very, very long time for them to melt. But if you have them immersed in the liquid, 
they melt very quickly. Anyway, um, I then developed this into much more sophisticated experiments and stuff, but this is my starting point. But whenever I was trying to describe these effects to people in the steel industry, I would use the ice in the cup example because it was easy for them to appreciate. And so it's not a very perfect analogy. Ice melting is not the same as scrap melting, but there is enough similarity that you can learn things from it. So that's another example of being a little bit, you know, innovative and thinking, you know, thinking about something you can actually observe yourself. So that's a good story for our uh, listeners to get motivated to start their own lab uh, back here. Actually, actually, there is a kind of uh, experiment we learned in high school uh, called uh, elevation of uh, boiling point and depression of freezing point. So, so I, th I think yeah, probably. Uh, yeah, similar, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, similar, similar thing is right. Yeah. yeah, I think and Vinesh can go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you, you touched upon uh, also the, the collaboration bit, and like my question is really around that bit, um, particularly in relation to industry. So uh, how, uh, as an ECR, being new to uh, you know uh, initiate the collaboration and all, particularly with the industry and applied researchers, what key strategies that um, you know you can you can think of that uh, that might aid uh, to convince uh, the industrial partner? Yeah. I'm about to say some things that could be regarded as old-fashioned ideas that are not in touch, but I think they're right, actually. I'll explain. When I speak to people about this now, they all talk about networking. Yeah, you know, like, let's go to the right meetings and meet the right people, and I completely disagree. <laughs> what I think you should be doing is, first of all, to realise that working with industry is a long game. If you want to become an expert on the glass industry or you want to become an expert on the on the cement industry or whatever it is, get ready for a long game. <laughs> Don't you you are not likely to just become a guru of that industry by turning up to a few meetings and networking with some people. This is not the way. The way to do it is to say you first of all, you have to be interested, right? You have to be interested. There's no point, no point aiming at an industry you're not interested in. But if you're really interested, like you like, I love glass making, right? First step, right? You love it yourself. <laughs> Second thing is go down to glass plants, make a nuisance of yourself. <laughs> yeah. Go and see every glass plant you can see. Talk to people about glass. Watch documentaries about glass. Read books about glass making. Spend time with artists who make glass. Um, look at paintings about glass making. Uh, Really, really look at the history of glass making. How, how did glass making develop, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and get involved, right? So that's like basically, re and then when you do these things, listen, listen to these experts, listen, listen to the people who make it. Listen to them. Don't start broadcasting your ideas. Listen to them right? and, and watch and pay attention. And they will appreciate that. You know something? In my experience, most people in the industry love it when an academic is truly interested in what they're doing. Yeah. They love it. They, they, they love the attention. They love the interest. And they respect you straight away. They, even if you don't know very much, they think, well, this, this guy's keen. <laughs> He's, he wants to learn. But go and spend time with industry, and, but don't expect to pay dividends straight away. It just yeah. doesn't work that way. Go down and learn and listen and, and, and soak in. That's my right. first point. Um, the other thing I want to say is when you then try to help them, understand their needs. What are they interested in? And try to understand what they're trying to achieve. Very often, they're trying to achieve something like, we're really losing productivity on this process or we're not hitting the quality of product that we'd like to make, right? It's normally something of this kind, right? Mm -hmm. Underneath that is normally quite a few scientific issues, right? But their interest is that direct, you know, the boss is saying, why can't we get more glass made in this glass furnace? You know, what, what's, what's the yeah. problem, right? So you've got to understand their interest. And then the next point is you should explain your interest to them. So. Once you've heard what their interests are and you've articulated what their interests are and how you can help them, right? You come up with a plan. Look, I've got this plan. 
What I want to do is I want to do, I measure the conductivity of the glass and then I want to try and relate it to the melting point and I'm going to come up with this model, you know, and this will tell you about the productivity. Then you should also explain to them your interest. You say, look, I want to help you guys, number one. You know, I'd like to help you guys. Two, I would like to publish a paper from it. Like I try and get a paper if we can get somewhere. And three, hopefully we can, you know, if it goes well, let's try and get some more money to do more research. And if you explain your interests as well, but after you've, ex ex how you're going to help their interests, most people in the industry are actually quite, are very happy to help you. But if you do it the other way around, <laughs> they often are not interested. They would like you to leave their, 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 their company, right? Because yeah. basically they appreciate that you have to get something out of this work, right? But they want to first of all hear about how you're going to help them. Step number one. Right. So you have to have that focus. So it's, but it's fine to articulate what you want to get, but not before you, not before you explain what you're going to help them with, right? Yeah. See what I mean? It's this sort yeah, of yeah. situation. And once again, it's a long game. So what this means is you might do some projects with the industry that are not your main interest, all right? They're not your main interest, but they're an opportunity to learn and they're also an opportunity to gain their confidence. So for example, when I first worked in the steel industry, I went down there and I said, how can I help you guys? And they said, oh, we've got these problems with mold fluxes. And I didn't know much about mold fluxes. The, I had no particular interest in mold fluxes, right? But they said to me, um, we need to understand how the properties of the mold flux affects the, the uh, quality of the product. That's essentially the problem they, they gave me. So I didn't know anything about it. You know, so I, I started reading about it. And as I read about it, I got more interested, actually. I, I started to find it quite interesting. And, um, you know, I started coming up with some experiments and ideas and plant trials. And, you know, I learned quite a bit. And I, I actually found the topic quite interesting after a while. Yeah? So I found it quite nice. And um, yeah, we, we had some success, you know. And uh, I got their confidence, you know. They went, oh, this guy, he seems to have a few ideas, this fellow. Yeah? <laughs> right? um, and so I was open to learn. You see what I mean? I wasn't closed-minded. I, I, I didn't say, oh, I've never heard of mold fluxes, you know. Yeah. You know go away. I'm not interested. No, I said, oh, all right. That's right. interesting. Let's see what I can find out. Now, if I was really bored by it, I would have done it and then said, look, I don't want to do it anymore. It's not really my thing. But as it was, I actually found it quite interesting. I didn't know anything about it, but once I got into it, I actually found it quite interesting. So I think you should be willing to um, to uh, do something, do a few things that are in their interest. And then as time goes by, then maybe you can ask them to help you with something, right, that you would really like to know because they normally decide, they start having some faith in you. And I've actually found people in the steel industry very generous towards me, very generous towards helping me. And it's because I've helped them. Right. It's nothing more complicated than that. So that's my, I hope, I hope that little lecture about how to get on with industry. Oh, can I just say something? I want to say yeah. something else about this industry thing. Mm -hmm. At my university, I have a reputation of being very, very good at working with industry. Right? That's a reputation I have, right? Can I tell you, I've made mistakes as well. I've made mistakes and sometimes I can't, I actually sometimes things have gone wrong, like the relationship is soured and I actually don't know what I've done wrong. I, I couldn't tell you. Like I'm actually confused what went wrong. So it's another thing to realise about it. Don't expect it. it's always going to be perfect working with injuries. That's just not realistic. So you, 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 have to, you have to build relationships and then you need to, you know, stick at it. And some of them will work and some of them won't and some of them will go great. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, com it's a complicated story. But what I would say, it's very rewarding working with industry. Uh, one of the things I love about industry is they tend to have short no's and short yeses. So what I mean by that is when you fund, when you write off to a funding body, you get these very long, complicated no's, right? It goes like... <laughs> <laughs> you write this 80 page document and then they send you back this essay about what they don't like about and do like about it. And then you have to write this other essay, right? To them about it. Oh my God. Um, in the industry, they just generally go, no. <laughs> and they don't like that. They don't want you to write an 80 page document. Right? Yeah. They want a two page document at most, right? It says, yeah. This is the problem. This is what I'm going to do. This is how much it's going to cost. And this is when I'm going to do it. 
<laughs> right. And you write this up and you give it to them and they go, no. <laughs> You know straight away. You, know, you normally know straight away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, or they might go, yeah, I like, I like it. <laughs> yeah. So okay, interesting. I find that aspect of it much more satisfying than government yeah. grant systems. Okay, interesting view. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, 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 they. Um, and it's, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's more sad. Sati- I find that part of it much more satisfying. They, they have, they have a, they have a fast no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, if I if I can ask you to, uh, you know, uh, from a from a yearly career researcher, I mean, we are uh, first trying to, you know, establish some collaboration with industries. Like, uh, um, you know, what, what would be the right way to approach them uh, when we are, uh, you know, if it's not networking via networking, or it's not. Pro- I understand. Like, we can yeah. we can develop. Yeah, no, no, our no, no. Yeah, uh, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, all right. So. What I would do is say you're really interested in the glass industry. I'll use that one. Yeah. Right, keep going with that one. Yeah, yeah, sure. So what you do is you um you drive you drive down to the glass company <laughs> and right. you say, "My name's Jeff. I'm a I'm a lecturer at the university, and I'm really interested in okay. glass. Can I talk to you guys?" Okay, okay, now I got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, just just step forward. Of course, if you know somebody in the university who's already working with them, then yeah. why not? Yeah. And of course, if you see an event saying uh, uh, lectures on uh, Australian glass industry, or sorry, uh, Canadian glass industry, of course, yeah. go along there and network, of course. What I'm really saying to you about the networking thing, and let me just be a little bit more explicit about this. When you go to these events that are organized, um, well, I don't know what it's like in, your, in Canada or the, or, 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 um, or the UK, but in Australia, we have these events, right? And there's like networking events. Yeah? And um, you go there and there's all these people who are on this networking circuit. They're clearly on a circuit. You know, like every second day they're going off for a breakfast or a lunch or something. You know? These are not the people who know all yeah. the details of the plan. They're not the... Right. Really? <laughs> Do you really think that's, <laughs> you, do, you, do you think do you think that the major glass company of Canada sends off their smartest engineer to that event? I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. True. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, why? So I keep doing some networking. Great. Well, I'm not. I'm not saying don't ever do it. But yeah. ask yourself that question. If you were running a company, would you send your smartest engineering off to these networking events? I don't think you would. <laughs> I think you would send somebody who was more in the, you know, the PR and management side, not somebody who's actually knows all the details of what's going yeah. on. So that's why going to the plant and <laughs> making, making a nuisance of yourself. <laughs> Once yeah. I went to a networking event where uh, they, they, they were manufacturing heavy farm equipment uh, and there were only HR and the factory personnel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, no, and that's exactly what I've noticed as well. So I know my yeah. view is not my view is I, I get asked quite a lot to speak to students about, you know, things about and, they go, and people say, what do you think about networking? And I, <laughs> I'm not in love with it. <laughs> right. right. I think what you said. I, yeah. I think what you said is a good input for the industries as well because they can send some experts for their conferences or for these sort of things. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Then, then it will be more transparent as yes. well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's. Oh, can I draw a big? That's a very good point, Namal. For example, if you see advertised the annual Canadian Glassmakers Society meeting, and uh, there's all technical presentations about glassmaking. Oh, that's probably a fantastic place to go. Because the worst thing that will happen is that you'll sit in the room and you'll watch all these people talking about glass making. You'll probably learn quite a bit, right? Yeah. But also at the break, if I have a cup of coffee, you might be standing next to the guy who's uh, in charge of glass making for the company, right? You can have a chat to him, right, about what he's doing. You know? yeah. Um. So yeah, that kind of networking. I'm in fact, it's these kind of generic networking that I'm being a little bit critical of. Um, and, and I'm going get sorry. I'm, I'm on. I'm a bit of a soapbox now. I can't resist. But um, yeah. The other one yeah. I like is you know, you know these things where they say come to this session and there'll be uh, what do they call it now? Um, I kind of it's a uh, brainstorming. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really? Really? 
do you really think do you really think that the brightest people in the world go along to those meetings come on <laughs> Do you think Elon Musk yeah. is going along to a brainstorming on electric vehicles with other people? Do you think he? Do you think he sends along his best, his brightest engineers to that? I don't think so. Right. Come on, let's, let's be serious here. And I've been to quite a few of those, and I find them extremely underwhelming. Um. Yeah. But do you know something? I've had so many wonderful conversations standing in a steel plant with the operator and the engineer discussing what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you can always learn something. I've been around many steel plants, many, many steel plants. Recently, I had a great day down at the Laverton steel plant, looking at a reheat furnace. Now, I've walked past reheat furnaces quite often, but I, I probably never paid much attention. I just sort of like knew the basic facts, right? But this day, I really was concentrating. And Mr. Reheat Furnace, the guy who absolutely loves reheat furnaces, was there, right? And he was telling me every detail. My God, I learned a lot. I learned heaps. I had a good time. I learned something. I met nice people. It was good. And he was happy. I could tell he was happy. He was happy because here's this professor come down, is spending a couple of hours. Oh, it's also the time. It's a time. Standing around for five minutes at a social event about something is a very superficial use of your time. Two hours at a plant staring at the reheat furnace is not superficial. Yeah. You're doing that because you are really interested. Interest. Huh? Yep, absolutely. I wouldn't have stood there for two hours talking to this guy unless I was interested, right? I was interested. Yeah, yeah. And he knew that, and I knew that. We're having a good yeah. time, right? We're learning something. We're, 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 you know, yeah. you know it's, it's going well. And that's another issue with some of these sort of events. They're a little mm -hmm. bit like people flitting around having very short conversations. Where When you go to a plant or you go or you're at a technical conference, you know, I'll tell you something interesting experience I always remember. I got invited very nicely by Tata Steel in India to come and give some lectures at their um, at their research labs, right? And I gave these lectures, and yeah, it was very good. Everybody's asking lots of questions. And what I remember about it distinctly was, is they said, oh, come out for dinner, Jeff. You know, oh, great, you know. So we go out to dinner. Oh, I thought we were going to talk about cricket or hockey or something, yeah? or politics. Or they just kept talking about steel making until about midnight. <laughs> what do you think about this, Jeff? What about if we do this? And... I found it fantastic. It was exhausting. I found it fantastic because clearly, 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 these people are in love with steelmaking. And they're pursuing, they're using this opportunity. This guy comes in, he's meant to be a bit of an expert. Mm. And they want to, you know, they want to ring every millisecond yeah. <laughs> having a discussion. Right? So, yeah, yeah. So these are fantastic opportunities. Yeah, those sorts of networking opportunities are fantastic. So I suppose what I'm saying is I'm not against networking. I suppose what I'm saying is I'm against superficial networking. That would be a better way of putting it. Yeah. So okay. sorry about my box no mail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we have good clarity. Yeah. Uh, you can't. Yeah. It would be useful. Yeah. You put it straightforward. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, I'm, I'm in that scenario. Like now, I should get the shoes and go and talk to the employees and just learn like what is happening there. Yeah. That's exactly. True. Listen. And listen. Yeah. 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 Listening is good. Yeah, good. I think Prem can go ahead with the next point. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of researchers encounter this uh, scenario as an accomplished researcher. What mistakes or pitfalls have you observed uh, early career researchers encountering yeah. and developing their research ideas and how can they avoid them? Yeah. All right. Good. Um, this is a, you, another topic dear to my heart. Um, so, all right. The thing I observe a lot at the moment is what I call the problem of hunting in packs. So let me explain that to you. All right. So this is what happens. A headline comes out about a hot topic. I don't know, it could be um, artificial intelligence applications to process control. Right? Well, it's an exciting topic. I, I, it's not my area, but I'm excited by it, right? And suddenly there's like 6,000 people working on it, right? And I see young researchers running towards that area. They want to work in that area. All right, all right. Warning sign. I'm going to hold a warning sign up to you straight away. Why are you going to where everybody else is going. Why are you doing that? 
Surely research is about going somewhere where not everybody else is thinking. Surely the really best research is done when you're doing something that somebody else is doing. Now, let's talk it through a little bit. Let's say you do love artificial intelligence uh, application, that you do sincerely love it. All right, and everybody else is running towards it. So why are you doing it? Well, there's only really a couple of reasons why. One, you've got some really original idea, something really different from everybody else. Huh? Huh? Yeah. That's basically the main reason. I suppose the other reason is maybe you might get some research activity going because you're running towards everybody else going. But that is, if you keep doing that, that is a formula for mediocre research. And I see a lot of people doing mediocre things because they, they hunt in packs. And just ask yourself, why would a really clever person want to work what everybody else is working on? It, it doesn't make any sense. And also, why do you want to work on something where there's a whole lot of really, really clever people already there? Why, why, why would you do that? It's not, yeah. You know. um, I, I, I have to tell this story. I'm sorry, Nima. Have you got time for this story? This story. Definitely. Is, yeah, it's for you. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. I want, to tell you, I want to tell you two stories about two brilliant men in my field. Uh, I knew both of them. Uh, one of them has passed away, unfortunately, um, but the other one is still alive. So, uh, so if he watches this, I'm sure he'll enjoy this story. Uh, there are two brilliant people in, in my field in the second half of the 20th century. Um, one of them was a guy called Dick Fruin, who passed away last year, actually. And Dick was a brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, uh, pyrometallurgist at Carnegie Mellon. And there was another guy called, uh, Rod, oh, he's still alive, Rod Guthrie. Rod's still alive, as far as I know. And Rod uh, is a brilliant... Uh, process metallurgist and he's based at McGill University oh. and they're about the same age about the same you know pretty similar. anyway um uh, a couple of years ago they had a retirement for uh, Rod Guthrie and um and everybody turned up to pay honor to Rod Guthrie because we all respect him so much and so did Dick Fruin so um anyway so this is room for the people and everybody's saying nice things about Rod you know oh, he's a great guy he's really clever it's all true, but a little bit boring. <laughs> He's a great guy. He's very clever. But, but we all know that. So. <laughs> but then they gave the microphone to Fruin. And what Fruin said, I've never forgotten, because it, it was a great insight. Let me tell you what he said. He said, I met this man in 1962. Like, maybe he said 1963, but some year like that. I arrived at Imperial College. I walked into this room, and I met this excitable Englishman called Rod Guthrie, the man standing there. And in about 15 minutes, I established that he was really quite brilliant and extraordinarily clever. And I said to him, what are you working on? And he said, I'm working on process kinetics. And I decided that I would not work in that area. And I decided to work on thermodynamics. Yeah. You get the story? Yeah. <laughs> right? Maybe so he was. He, he looked at this guy and he went, you know something? He's really brilliant. <laughs> Let him work on that. I'll go and work somewhere else. Right? Yeah, I totally understood. I mean, uh, you know, you get so humbled by what they say. and you know. Yeah, uh, but just if you think about, like he, he did it half as a joke. But if you think about it, it's a really, really, really good point. Yeah um and um and he, he only, everybody else was was saying all these nice things about rod they took quite a few minutes to basically say he's a really lovely guy he's really clever right <laughs> they took five, five or six minutes <laughs> nick fruin said this in about two minutes i arrived there i went to the room there's this guy i established straight away he's quite brilliant i decided not to work in that area <laughs> i go work somewhere else <laughs> and good luck for you rod and he sat down great speech fantastic speech <laughs> And sums up sums up a really really important point that I need to get across to early researchers. Yeah. Don't run towards areas where there's all these clever people already working. You should try to go to something else. Um, the other thing I want to say is you need to be patient. Um, if you have some good ideas, don't expect everybody to love your ideas straight away. It's not realistic. You, you have to persist. You have to, you know, 
it's not very often we have those Einstein moments where you come with an idea and then three years later, everybody goes, that guy's a t total genius. That doesn't happen very often. <laughs> it's more like you have a good idea and then over a couple of decades, <laughs> people say, you know something? That, that Nand Haven guy's got a good idea. <laughs> Actually, Namal was in his PhD. Uh, he's very lucky. He, he, he published a couple of papers a couple of years ago that were just like perfect timing about six months later, one year later, everybody went, that's a really good idea. So that was an unusual, that, that, it doesn't happen very often that, but normally it's a little bit, sometimes you just have to be patient. So um, I say to ECRs, be a little bit patient. Like, you know, don't expect success will happen straight away. You know, eh, eh. believe in yourself, persist, keep, keep pushing. Um, and the third one is another slightly controversial point. And I hope, Namoa, I don't have too much controversy in your, in your, in your, uh, your wonderful podcast, and that is, don't get obsessed with with uh, with uh, uh, with uh, metrics. You know something? I've met people who've got three thousand citations in two years, and their ideas are really terrible. I've met some people who've got five citations, and their ideas are quite brilliant. So, you know, uh, you know, it's yeah. You know, don't, don't get me wrong; it's nice to have citations. It's it's good. It, but don't get obsessed with it. Don't obsess about it. Can I tell you the people who obsess about citations, what they do? They publish a lot of review papers, right? Yeah. That's their strategy. Do you think Do you think a brilliant scientist is going to write review papers all the time? I don't think so. No. I think a really clever scientist is going to be hoping that people review their ideas. Not I the mean, other way around. Yeah. Yeah. Every now and then, maybe, you know, write a review. Yeah. But most, most of the time. But that's the strategy. Yeah. So that's an example of obsessing about metrics. And please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying you shouldn't be conscious of metrics. You should be, but not obsessed by it. And yeah. it's, I, it's at the moment a little bit out of control, in my opinion, how much people worry about, about metrics. Worry about having good ideas. Worry about having good students. Worry about how good you're writing the paper, right? Worry about that. Worry about that stuff. Don't worry about, did you get five citations this month or 25 or whatever, you know? You know, if you do good work, eventually the citations will come in some shape or form, eventually. You might just be a little bit patient. But don't obsess about it. Uh, yeah, that's, that's something I want to say as well. I hope I haven't said too many controversial things in the month. That's an absolutely I, I think, amazing insight. Uh, uh, yeah, Professor I think that's... And... I think that's the best way of putting application and uh, quality uh, rather than like going behind uh, areas and uh, uh, quantity. But this also brings to the point of like uh, for an early career researcher or for someone who has uh, recently uh, completed a PhD and he's aiming for an academic position. Yes. So ho hopefully like uh, this will be the next point of like going for a postdoctoral position because most of the university seeks for someone who has postdoctoral position to be appointed as a lecturer. Sure. So if an early, uh, say for an early career researcher, what are the uh, few things that he needs to prioritize in the early uh, he'll career? See, uh, he'll he or she. So I'm sorry. Yeah. He or she needs to be uh, prioritized if uh, they aim for a lecturer or assistant professor position, like even in Australia yeah. or for general, like international. Yeah, no, no, that, that, that's, that's a good, that's an easy question to answer, but also it's important to go over it. I have done an awful lot of this. I've interviewed a lot of people entering lecturing jobs, right? So at, at different universities. Uh, I think there really is sort of three major things I'm looking for. Um, the first one is I want to see that they can deliver competent, uh, well-structured lectures and tutorials, right? Because when you're recruiting somebody as a lecturer, the last thing in the world you want to do is recruit somebody, recruit, uh, recruit somebody who for the next 20 years delivers the worst, most boring lectures you've ever heard in your life and all the students uh, just hate the subject because the, student, the lecturer is no good. Now, you don't need to be recruiting a genius presenter, right? you know, but, but you want somebody you know is going to do a good professional and you know well done job in teaching. So this means that when you're a, a postdoc, please you get an opportunity to tutor or teach, do it and do a good job. Make sure you do an excellent job. Really, really put the effort in to make it good. And that really just means about caring about the students, right? It's really about 
it really comes down to are you really thinking about the students uh, experience of your of your teaching because if you do that it's very hard not to be a good teacher the only way you're a bad teacher is because you're not caring about the students that's the real reason why you're a bad teacher everything else comes from basically saying i care whether the students are learning or not right and 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 so that's a very important. so that's one of the first things can this person has either the potential or the demonstrated ability of delivering a well-structured well-done lecture or tutorial that's point number one. Point number two, does this person have the ability to develop good ideas and implement those good ideas? Do they have some demonstrated ability at being able to come up with ideas and make them happen. What's a bit underwhelming with a postdoc is one that's never developed their own idea or they're just always working on their supervisor's ideas. That's that's an underwhelming that's an underwhelming characteristic, right? You you want to be convinced that these people are, yeah, they've got ideas that they can develop. And maybe even if they had had an opportunity, they, they're excited about their ideas. So, for example, if I ask somebody in an interview about a lecture, I say, oh, what, what, what sort of research would you like to do? And, this, and the person says, well, I've been working on this. I've been working on the melting of glass. But what I'm really excited about is understanding how lava melts. I'd love to do work on molten lava. That's the thing I'm most excited about. And I have this idea of being measuring this by doing this, but I haven't unfortunately got the resources yet, but that's one thing I really want to do. That would immediately impress me that this person has ideas. And maybe maybe their idea is not that great. I don't know. It's hard to judge. You know, but, but the fact they have ideas that they want to do something is, is, is impressive. Uh, and then the third one is, are these people capable of forming collaborations? Are they capable of working with other people? So if they're like got anti sort of social behavior or if they're sort of very isolated from everybody else, do they look like the sort of people who don't like, you know, don't feel comfortable with collaborating? I, I think that's not a very good thing in the modern university. Like you can have one or two people in a, in a university department who maybe are extremely narrow and don't collaborate with people. Yeah, but you don't in general want that. You want somebody who's got the ability to collaborate with either industry or collaborate with their colleagues or, you know, collaborate with somebody. So I think there's the three things I look for when I interview somebody to become a lecturer. And if I've got ticks against those boxes, then, you know, it's all coming down to just, you know, oh, who's the best fit? You know, there's three guys, three candidates there. They're all quite good. Which one? I don't know, you know. So, yeah, that, but if you don't have those three characteristics, I think, you know, I'm a bit sort of, well, you know, like you could be have really good research ideas, but you you don't know how to give a lecture, and you're not very collaborative. That's quite a turnoff, I think, in a job interview for a lecturer. So those are fairly obvious points, but does that does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And this is a quite like I also receive a lot of queries from the aspirants. Like, what do the professors look for? Like these things. Uh, uh, how do uh, I can impress them? Like they try to impress based on like just. So reading their uh, profile and then just spitting out like what they see in their profile rather than telling about them how curious they are like what they want yes. to call to you so i think yeah, oh this... yeah no that's a very good point it's extremely <laughs> underwhelming if somebody, if somebody says oh i love your ideas i'd love to work on them um oh, yeah <laughs> i think yeah <laughs> what your suggestions can make a perfect sense to those who are uh, those who are trying to evolve and giving them a confidence to stand alone and become an independent as a researcher as such, yeah. I think uh, Dinesh can go ahead. Dinesh. Yeah. So uh, my question is really around the, you know, when, when we are being a, being an ECR, um, and we will often encounter uh, like rejections from uh, when we are applying any grants to competing. Uh, Even when you're an old professor, you have the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but maybe the percentage of rejection probably maybe uh, improved, uh, you know, reduced over yeah, time. Yeah, but, uh, That's yeah. true. E exactly. Yep. So the, the, the question is like, you know, if, if the if the aspirant thinks that like, you know, there is a true potential in the in the in the the proposal, then what he or she should uh, should do uh, on the re rejected proposal, how they can take yeah. this forward? Yeah. Yeah, all right. All right. Well, I have a few things to say about this. Um, all right. Uh, it's disappointing when a grant's rejected. Uh, when you look at the rejection, you want to try and understand why it was rejected, right? You need to understand. Um, 
Sometimes it's actually nothing very substantial. Sometimes it's just you're not you don't have a fantastic you don't have a lot of resume as long as you you don't have a huge resume or you know you've got limited publications or maybe your ideas are a little bit out of favor who knows now at that point if that's what's happened if it's not really anything particularly wrong with the application or the ideas if you've reached that conclusion don't lose confidence please remember it's just a funding agency it's just a funding agency so for example in my university People obsess sometimes about the Australian Research Council. They keep going, oh, the Australian Research Council didn't like my grant or blah, blah, blah. No, no, this is not, this is not, this is not Albert Einstein or, or Rutherford telling you your grant's no good. This is a funding agency. Don't, don't get too obsessed by it, right? Now, of course, sometimes the feedback is actually got something of substance, right? Like you read and you go, yeah. He's right, or she's right, whatever. That's right. That's not very good. I didn't explain that very well. No, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, good point, you know. So, but, so that point, you need to take the criticism on board. But sometimes it's got nothing to do with the quality of the grant or the quality of your ideas. Sometimes it's just pure uh, random aspects of the process, right? So don't lose confidence. It's just a funding agency, huh? What you do take seriously is feedback from somebody you really respect. So, for example, if you have a really good grant, uh, you are really happy with this grant application and it got rejected by a funding agency uh, and you weren't sure what to, what to do because you, you thought, am I, am I missing something? Why don't you contact somebody you really respect? Find a professor in your field that you, you really have a lot of respect for. And say to them, look, I, this grant got rejected. I, I don't know what. Could you just have a bit of a read of it and tell me what you think? Right? Um, that's a good idea as well. Because you, 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 because listening to somebody you really respect tell you what is right and wrong of what you're doing is, um, you know, yeah. is, is, is something that you can take on board. Um, so if you get this grant rejected, yeah, don't, 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 um, you know, don't dwell too much on your inadequacies. Try and learn from it. But the next step is look for other opportunities. And there always are other opportunities, particularly with industry, as I mentioned before, the fast no or the fast yes, right? Yeah. So maybe your idea can be turned into an industrial research idea. So that's much. E that's quite easy to do. You know, it's just, sorry, it can be quite easy to do. So then you can go and find out whether they're interested and go and talk to them. Now, I can tell you in my own case, um, I won't go into all the details of it, but I didn't do very well with some government funding for a while in the, in the mid-early 90s. And I came to the conclusion that it was just to do with the sort of politics of the system in Australia. I went and shifted to another country. That's a rather extreme measure. <laughs> but it was a very successful measure. I got my applications that were rejected in Australia, went to Canada, and they loved them. So sometimes you have to do that as well. You've got to remember sometimes some countries are small, like... You know, like you can have some localized politics in 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 these systems, right? Mm. It's it's the way it's. You shouldn't get too angry. Some people get very angry with these things. I don't. I just realize that you know you don't you can't be naive. There is going to course going to be an element of personal politics in all these processes, right? But also, the smaller the country, the more opportunity there is that you know one person or two people don't like you, and you know. You know, so yeah, where when you're in a larger country, those things tend to be less, uh, yes, yeah. I think, less prelevant because of the size of the people. Yeah. So you know, these are just the realities of the world. There's no point getting really angry about it. It's just it's just thinking about it logically. So um, so um, that's my first point, I suppose. Is you know, uh, going back to what I just said, is you should um, try and understand whether the rejection was any substance to the rejection. Uh, and secondly, seek somebody who you respect to give you some feedback if, you, if you're not sure from the grant. And then look for other funding, like from the industry funding or maybe some seed funding from your department or, in my case, go to another country. <laughs> that's, a, that's a relatively extreme measure. But, um, yeah, um, so, um, you know, those, those are a number of strategies. But uh, please always remember that these are just funding agencies. Right. Just don't lose sight of that. You know, um, yeah. If if some professor that you really respected in your field didn't thought the grant had some poor aspects to it, that's much more concerning 
than a funding agency rejecting your grant. Right. Yep. Yeah, I think that will give a wider uh, viewpoint for the uh, aspirants to look at these rejections uh, rather than like personalizing and getting obsessed with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think don't obsess. I would like yeah. to ask the next yeah. question. Yeah. Sure. So, um, how good of an administrator you, you should be if you want to run your own lab apart from the te te technical knowledge? All right. Interesting question. Um, not too good. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm joking. Um, uh, look, um, I would put, I, I, understand, I understand the intent of that question. I, I would like to say this. What's more important in, an, in a research career is to be a either or both an excellent team player or a good leader. Sometimes you have to do both, right, depending on the situation, right? So, for example, uh, I'm currently in uh, heavily occupied in dark matter research. It's one of my things I do. I'm not the leader. I don't. I don't have the intellectual knowledge to lead in that area. I am more of a team player, right? And I try to be a good team player. But Namal knows that in the steel area at, at Swinburne, I have the intellectual ability and knowledge to lead, right? So it's logical that I lead, and I should lead, and I should try to lead, right? and take the responsibility of leadership. So I think it's more important to be concentrating on being a good team player and a good leader than it is in trying to be a good administrator. Now, that doesn't mean you should ignore administration, but I just want to place there's more, more emphasis on those things than there are on the admin processes. The admin processes are a, a means to those two goals. Understand? They're the means. They're not the. They're not the thing in itself, right? The thing that's important is that within the department that you're in, that you're a good team player. The important thing in your own research group is that you're some sort of leader. The admin is a servant to that. Okay. So now, having said all that, which I believe to be true, um, yeah, you should you shouldn't ignore the admin. You should make try and do it as well as you can, but. You're not an administrator, you're a researcher and a teacher. That's your job. The administration that you do is just a, a means to those things. All, all you're trying to do is teach well and do research well, basically. Right? Well, sorry, yeah. teach, research and collaborate, right? basically those three things, really. So the, the admin is a means to those things. And yeah. so you're as good as you need to do to, to succeed in those things. But you shouldn't be obsessing about the details of admin. I'll give an example of a waste of time. I'm sorry. I'm about to say something now, which if everybody followed, would cause disaster around university departments around the world. When you're in a university department and somebody says, we need somebody to organize the regeneration of the web page, try to run away or pretend you didn't hear what they said, right? That is a great <laughs> example of a pointless administrative task because I have never heard anybody happy with a web page ever. They're always <laughs> saying it's wrong, it's no good. And, you know, you don't want to, it's one of these admin tasks that never ends, you know. You could take over your life. You could, your whole <laughs> life could become maintaining the web page. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and do you know something? Why are you doing that? Because you want to be a researcher and a teacher. <laughs> and, there was this. Um, and so when, when, whenever I see something come through, we need to fix the web page. Who wants to take charge? I was, I was like, pretend I didn't hear or, you know, <laughs> oh, 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 sorry. I, I got to get the hockey training. Sorry, excuse me. You know. <laughs> now, because I'm a team player, when somebody says to me, Jeff, would you check out your web page and just see whether you can improve it or could you give us some suggestions? Of course, I will do something. Of course. Of course. Uh, but I won't, <laughs> I won't be running. <laughs> <laughs> towards the details of changing my web pages. Right? I just won't be doing that. And also, I don't like people asking me to do things that are clearly not my job. For example, there is sort of a tendency going on in Australian universities at the moment, where sometimes they ask the, the academic to be the payroll officer, that they start oh. giving you all these forms about paying oh. people. Okay. And I just, I just go, I'm really sorry, guys. I'm not a payroll officer. It's um, actually, I have a lot of respect for payroll officers. It's a fairly complex and detailed thing, right? You've got to understand taxation and superannuation. It's quite involved. And yeah. you know, I, I don't know. I don't know all the details. So please, why are you asking me to do this? I, 
But that, you know, that's right. Please ask somebody who understands it. Absolutely. Yeah. So you've got to be careful about. There is a bit of a tendency in recent times, I've noticed, to get academics to do things like that. I think it's important just to say, I really do not understand this. You know, and be honest, Good. I'm not a payroll officer. Like I have had to say several times, I'm not a contract lawyer. I, right. I don't yeah. have training yeah. in contract law. Absolutely. I don't have training in web uh, web page development. <laughs> Absolutely. I just don't. So, but, but, yeah, so, I don't know, uh, just a follow-up question on this. Sorry, uh, it's like as you go uh, high and high, right? As a uh, from a uh, assistant to associate professor level, then um, the percentage of like individual contribution to like uh, the managerial, uh, the leadership, and the other tasks of leading a group, kind of like the mm -hmm. contribution share, kind of kind of changes, right? Then how do we? Uh, how do you really strike the balance between them? <laughs> I, I, I'm not a good person to ask. I, I probably haven't done a good job of that. <laughs> um, yeah, I've taken on a lot of um, look. Um, this is when you become a when you become a full professor, and it's a bit different uh, in countries about how, how hard that's achieved. You have to take stock and say, well, you know, I've made it. I've, I've succeeded. I'm, I'm a full professor. And that's that's really good. So now I need to give back. I need to I need to give back to people, right? Yeah. And um, so, you know, I do quite a lot of things that, you know, probably aren't helping me personally, you know, but are things, that, you know, that need to be done and do it done well. So, yeah. for example, I'll give you an example. I, I don't, I, I've done many times going talking to high school children and um, about, about studying engineering and science. And they ask me because I bring some enthusiasm and some, and some, you know, um, you know, uh, I, I do a good job. Basically, I do a good job. Now, is that a good way of me spending my time? Well, maybe not, you know. In, but on the other hand, you know, I, I think when I look at it, you know, there's about, in my department, I think there's about two or three of us that could do a good job in that. We have the right attributes to be, you know, able to do that. So, you know, well, all right, well, I should help. So, um, so is it, but is it great for my personal career? Probably not, but not everything is not everything is about your personal career right because you know, yeah, you're a team player so yeah so yeah this is what you want to try and avoid is doing too many things like that right that that's when you yeah you got to be careful and also you should be careful not to take advantage of people yourself so you know when you're an academic and there's some very nice person who's always willing to do those things you shouldn't take advantage of them you should you should spare them a bit you know like the guy that's fantastic at organizing the open day he shouldn't be asked every year. It's not reasonable. Yeah. You know, you should you should have a go at it one year. <laughs> give the poor give the poor guy a rest. You know, you know. Right. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there is sometimes a bit of a tendency that actually we're talking. Oh, we've just been slightly joking about gender issues, but there is sometimes uh, a tendency for those sort of things to fall on some of the female members of staff. That's not fair. Mm -hmm. It's not right. Right. I'm yeah. not saying it happens all the time, but it happens a bit. Right. So what I'm saying that's not right. In that case, one of the senior academics should say, "Look, I think let's uh, let's uh, concentrate on uh, research a bit. I'll, I'll do the I'll do the open day today, or whatever it is." You know, so that's also leadership of a different kind, right? It's not leadership about your own area. It's a it's about ethical, um, moral behaviour within your department. You know, about being a good person, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes you just have to step forward. Um, actually, in my career, I've done that, a fair bit of that. I was a head of department for a number of years for that reason alone. It wasn't because I wanted to be a head of the department, but for this particular department, there were some issues going on, and I was the logical person to sort those issues out. I, I didn't really want to do it. It wasn't something I was dying to do, but I looked at it and said, you know something? It needs to be done. I'm the right person. I'll go and do it. So there's a bit of that. That's that's a little bit more further in your career. That's not when you're the ECR, right? That's yeah. that's that's something yes. for professors yes. to sort out, yeah. not 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 yeah, lecturers and PhD postdocs. Yeah. True. Yeah. Well, I would like to ask one question. Um, <laughs> so I, I see that you you are associated with the uh, you are a distinguished member of uh, Institute of Materials, Minerals, and Mining, which is a yes. collaborative organization for uh, which the uh, Royal Engineering Society in the UK. Um, yes. Nirmal is also a member too. So, um, how, how is the relationship with uh, uh, you know uh, 
how, how does it help in our research uh, research this uh, right. association well, that's, a, with that's a good question so i've been um, a long term member of two organizations the tms and the um, asit which is formerly called the iss so the just so the listeners understand the tms stands i think for the minerals materials and yeah. Uh, metal society <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and the and the and the uh the ASIT is the Association of Iron Steel Technology it was formerly known as the Insti- uh, the uh Institute of uh, Steel uh, well, International Society of Steel oh, I've forgotten now ISS it was called um I've last few years become a member of the organization you mentioned IMO3 so I'm a more recent member of the IMO3 but I've been a long term member of those other two I would describe the membership of those organizations as highly beneficial, the highly highly beneficial. First of all, um I've met lots of wonderful people at their events. I've been to many of their conferences and also they have done a lot to promote me. So they've given me um you know um allowed me to speak at international forums. They've uh, invited me to be heads of their various um committees. Um they've given me nice awards. So I'm extremely grateful to the societies and I I love being a member of those societies and I've always been keen to give. I'm a more recent member of the one you just mentioned and I only relevant like 3 or 4 years. And I have been able to give as well, I've been able to do things with them. I'd like to do more actually. I really like the IMO3. One of the reasons why I joined the IMO3 recently in the last 4 years is because um I'm I have a dual citizenship so I'm I'm English and Australian I'm, I'm very Australian but I have an English citizenship as well and I thought you know I I felt like sort of linking up with one other part of my background and becoming more involved in things in England and I have made a conscious effort to say last 5 or 6 years do a lot more things in England I've been giving lectures there and visiting universities and working with companies and that's partly just a sort of feeling of wanting to link with one part of my heritage and an interesting part of the world and that's also one of the reasons why I joined the IMO3 and i must say the IMO3 has been very 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 nice to me uh they've given me uh my students two best paper awards thank you very much <laughs> oh that's it um the mail one one of them and then also they just recently did something extraordinarily nice uh, they gave me the Bessemer gold medal which is basically the best award you can get and steal it Well, if it's not yeah. the best one it's the second best one. I don't know, you have to it's a very good one anyway. And uh I was completely humbled and amazingly uh thrilled. Uh to give you an idea how very uh wonderful it was is I didn't know I'd been nominated. So I didn't know. Uh-huh. So I I opened up my email and the first part of the email said oh the mail's won an award for best paper. <laughs> I was feeling very good. Then the second thing I opened the next one said you've won the best in the gold medal. Well, I was completely oh. completely over, completely overwhelmed right um and what a privilege what a what a tremendous privilege and uh, all my heroes are in that list yeah uh, all the people i really respect so for example i made many reference before uh to uh Gaffrey and Fruin I'm pretty sure Fruin's definitely in that list if Gaffrey isn't he shouldn't be but Fruin's definitely in that list um and um the um you know a lot of the people who made great inventions and developments in my in my in my field are in that list so wow what a what a wonderful thing right so um yeah so i think societies are really good things and um you should be involved and it's also a good way of giving back to the community yeah um so um for example uh, just to give you a concrete example a few years ago the asit gave me the elliot lectureship which is a very big honor and um Uh, named after John Elliot who's a giant figure at MIT in our field and uh, the, they gave me money to go around the world and give lectures about steel making right this is like this is like asking Tendulkar to go and have a, a batting <laughs> exhibition all around the world you know like, yeah, that kind of thing right? so i was thrilled i went everywhere i went everywhere they gave me a bit of money and i went around there and i gave lectures in uh, i'm trying to think i gave the lectures in uh in uh career I uh, India in three places in Australia in America in Canada and Indonesia yeah and um it was wow what a privilege you know I I was going around to explaining to a why I love steel making right so yeah and that, and, it, it, and I think it really was a good thing for the society so that they made me feel good but I also helped the society so yeah so I think those I think societies are excellent things 
and it's the kind of networking I approve of. You know, I've been I was criticizing networking before, but when you go to a to a, a learned society where people are trying to share knowledge and meet each other, it's great. I've met wonderful people through this this association. So, yeah, join the society. It's a good one. Good on you, Prem, for being in the IMO three, mate. <laughs> Yeah. What, uh, what's your what's your field, Prem? What do you what's your, what area do you work in? So, um, no, currently I don't work in the field, but then uh, I am uh, I'm a graduate of Indian Institute of Technology. I did the research in material science, uh, so aluminium copper alloys. Uh, oh well, uh, yeah. yeah, well that's a, they do a lot of good. Re there's a lot of good papers and stuff published in the IMO three from those topics. So it's a good area to be in. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well I I, I yeah. think we've reached so, the end there. Yeah, we've done that's our well. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we have almost reached the end of this uh, podcast. So yeah. we would like to thank uh, Professor Jeff, uh, who has shared valuable insights for early career researchers on developing research ideas. He emphasized the importance of balancing novelty and feasibility, optimizing resources, engaging industrial partners, avoiding common pitfalls. So uh, early career researchers can now navigate their research journey with a clear roadmap uh, with the expertise of uh, Professor Jeff through this podcast. So uh, once again, uh, thank you, uh, Jeff, for being a guest of our podcast. So no, I think it's a really, I think it's really commendable what you're doing, having these frank discussions about these topics, and um, and uh, yeah, good on you, good on you for doing it, and. Uh, yeah. um, I think it's a good, it's a very good thing. I, I I haven't watched all. I've watched a couple of your of things. I think they're very well done. Yeah. And um and good on Namal and Dinesh and Prem for having a go at doing this. I think it's a worthwhile activity. 